Afternoon, everyone. First item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and answers. Um, and the first question of the portfolio questions is on social justice, communities and pensioners. Right. Question one, Gavin Brown. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the priorities are for the housing supply budget in 2016-17. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Let me answer succinctly, Presiding Officer. This Government's priority is to increase affordable housing supply across Scotland, with a particular focus on increasing the number of social rented homes. In addition, we recognise the importance of offering a range of home ownership options to help people to buy a new home. All of our investment in housing not only provides more homes for rent and home ownership, but also helps support construction jobs and sustains business across Scotland. Thank you very much. Gavin Brown. Grateful for that succinct answer, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, is, it, is it correct to say that the help to buy budget is being reduced, and if so, by how much? Presiding Officer, the help to buy budget is £195 million that is funded through financial transactions, and all the financial transactions are committed, uh, including to other parts of the housing budget. And the number of people who will be assisted by the new phase of the help to buy scheme will exceed 7,000, nearly 7,500 people, which is a 1,000 increase in the number assisted by the first scheme. Many thanks. Uh, question two, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to prevent people from becoming homeless. Minister Margaret Burgess. Preventing homelessness is a priority for the Scottish Government, and we have seen consistent falls in recorded homelessness in Scotland in recent years. The falls in homelessness are due to the promotion of the housing options approach to prevention, which local authorities and their partners have developed with both financial and practical support from the Scottish Government. We are committed to continual improvement in the delivery of this approach and non-statutory guidance and a training toolkit will shortly be available to help improve the consistent delivery of homelessness prevention. Preventing homelessness is part of our overall housing strategy, backed by more than £1.7 billion of investment in the lifetime of this Parliament. We have already exceeded our target to deliver 30,000 affordable homes, including 20,000 homes for social rent, and we have pledged to deliver 50,000 new affordable homes over the next five years. Thank you very much. Jane Baxter. Thank the Minister for that response. Homelessness is increasingly be becoming visible in the streets of our cities this winter, and the Scotland Homelessness Monitor, recently published by Crisis, shows that attempts to prevent homelessness are often relatively light touch, consisting primarily of information and si signposting. Will the Minister commit to a renewed approach to tackling and preventing homelessness, including a new cross-departmental strategy? Minister. Um, we have a strong focus on preventing homelessness in Scotland and work uh, across party, uh, across uh, stakeholders. We have a stakeholder group, the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group, of why, of which I sit on as a member. COSLA are on that as a member. We also have Shelter and other organisations, um, Health Scotland as well is on that uh, group. We are looking very closely at ensuring that everyone who is homeless in Scotland can access the services and the support is available to them. And we will we'll continue to look at that and review that at every single meeting we hold. It is an absolute priority uh, to reduce homelessness in Scotland. Thanks so much. Alex Johnson. Will the Minister consider looking once again at those who have specific problems in holding down a tenancy to see if uh, additional aid can be given to support them in their tenancies and prevent them becoming homeless? Minister. Um, that, that is currently ongoing and is something I think the member rightly highlights that that is something that is ongoing is in supporting people and keeping them in tenancy and I, I visited a, a housing options team this week in air just to see how that works in practice and of course we, if there's practice there that we can spread out to other uh, local authority areas and to other housing option teams who meet regularly then we will, we will do that there's lots of good work going on across the country across local authorities in supporting people into tenancies. It's recognised that it does work, it does prevent homelessness, and we'll continue to do that and work with them to ensure that we, we, we see the results of that. Many thanks. Question three, Graham Pearson. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has made of the effect of the reduction in fuel poverty and energy efficiency funding in the draft budget 2016-17 on its ability to meet its statutory fuel poverty and housing climate change targets. Minister. We have allocated £103 million to tackle fuel poverty and energy efficiency in 2016-17 which will be used to help install energy efficiency measures, including solid wall insulation in 14,000 homes, building on the more than 900,000 measures delivered since 2008. We have broadly maintained the expenditure available for fuel poverty and energy efficiency in the budgets that we have under our control in what is a tough financial climate. The 2015-16 budget was increased over the course of the year with £15 million of consequentials from the UK Government's Green Deal Home Improvement Fund. This scheme was ended without warning by the UK Government and is therefore no longer available to us. The, this Government is fully committed to eradicating fuel poverty in Scotland and overall we are on track to meet our statutory 2020 target of a 42% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions but we do recognise the scale of the challenge before us. Thanks. Graham Pearson. I thank the Minister for that response. The Government's Scottish House Conditions Survey 2012-14 has just reported, and in my own area at East Ayrshire, it records a 3% rise in those reporting fuel poverty, and within Dumfries and Galloway, a 1% rise in fuel poverty during that two-year period. Has the Minister considered any specific steps she will now take in light of the 13 per cent cut in budget allocation to deal with this rise in fuel poverty? Minister. What I would say to the member is that the methodology that is used in the Scottish House Conditions Survey to estimate fuel poverty was recently changed to include the contribution of the Warm Home Discount Scheme. But we are always looking at ways to reduce fuel poverty in Scotland. We have already announced very recently, the Cabinet Secretary uh, announced the Scottish uh, Energy Efficiency programme for Scotland, the National Infrastructure Scheme, which is looking in detail at how we can reduce and improve energy efficiency in homes and buildings across Scotland. It will not just look at um, the social rented sector or indeed houses, it will look at buildings as well across Scotland. And all of that is part of our energy efficiency programme and we'll continue to do that and work with our stakeholders. We have a strategic working uh, group who's going to advise and inform the government. They're working alongside the, Sc the Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum and the Rural, Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force to build on our efforts and drive forward the fuel poverty agenda. Thank you so much. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister rightly mentioned the House uh, survey uh, the, and the latest figures in that. Is she aware that in that survey the number of households in fuel poverty in Shetland are more than half? And therefore, what specific steps, as Mr Pearson rightly also asked, what specific steps does the Government have to address the particular problems in rural communities such as Shetland? Minister. Well, uh, as I announced in the previous answer, we have set up the Rural uh, fuel, fuel Poverty Task Force who are looking specifically at the issues in rural and remote areas. We also have adapted our HEAP scheme to take into account of the fuel poverty in uh, rural areas where they can spend more per measure because uh, we recognise the difficulties faced there. We have made a number of other measures to also help with the training and accreditation of the installers to ensure that we can provide support to them uh, in local, to support local businesses in rural areas as well. Much. Ken McIntosh, briefly. Thank you. As well as cutting the fuel poverty budget in, the bu in this year's budget, uh, the Minister has cut business rates relief for renewables industry in Scotland. Can the Minister tell me how much uh, money that will cost and what the impact will be on climate change of that measure? You can answer that if you want, Minister, but it's not the question. That... Yes, we'll write to him. I'll speak to the Energy Minister and write to the member on that. Do fine. Thanks very much. Question for Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what rights non-UK EU citizens who live in Scotland have to participate in elections. Mr Joe Fitzman. Non-UK EU citizens who live in Scotland can vote at European Parliament, Scottish Parliament and local government elections. In addition, Commonwealth citizens from Malta and Cyprus and citizens of the Republic of Ireland who are resident in Scotland can vote at the UK parliamentary elections. 
I thank right? the Minister for the answer, and as you will know, that will not concern me, uh, neither I live in Malta or in Cyprus. But would you agree with me that stopping EU citizens residing in Scotland from voting in the EU referendum after they will have been able to vote in every Scottish ele parliamentary election and in two Scottish constitutional referendums since 1997 is in fact a breach of human rights law? The, the Scottish Government is very disappointed that the franchise is not being extended to EU national, nationals resident in the UK. Around 170,000 non-UK EU citizens have chosen to make Scotland their home. EU citizens can vote in the Scottish Parliament elections, as I've said, and most recently, as Christian Allard said, they, they had a vote in our, our independence referendum. The case for extending the vote to EU citizens in the, the EU referendum is clear, and I'd urge the UK Government to reconsider, and while they're at it, they should make arrangements to allow 16- and 17-year-olds to vote in the election too. Thank you so much. Question 5, Jamie McGregor. Um, thank you. What recent discussions... It, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with representatives of Argyll and Butte Council. Mr Marco Biaggi. I am meeting Argyll and Butte Council on the 1st of March to discuss matters of mutual interest. Other ministers and officials also meet regularly with the Council. Jamie McGregor. Uh, is the Minister aware of the extent of the concern among councillors and the public in Argyll and Butte and the severity of the spending cuts being considered there and their impact on vital local services? In particular, can he comment on the possible loss of core funding to our Guile and Butte Citizens Advice Bureau network, which directly prevents dozens of people each year becoming homeless and thus saves the Council hundreds of thousands of pounds every year? Minister. The local government settlement as a whole has been challenging but fair, and that applies to Argyll and Butte as much as anywhere else, representing a 2% reduction of the overall expenditure available. I would point out that for Argyll and Butte, many of the things that we are asking for come with uh, attached funding. The council tax freeze will be funded to the tune of £1.4 million for Argyll and Butte, and their share of the £250 million for health and social care is £4.6 million. Uh, I will endeavour to investigate the issue, the specific issue in Argyll and Butte that he raises, as I'm not aware of whether that is a local funding or a national funding issue, and I will write to the member uh, on that issue. Neil Finlay. The Minister meets Argyll and Butte Council and other councils. Is he not embarrassed and ashamed of what his government is doing to local government? Minister. It's always uh, a ray of sunshine when Neil Findlay comes to ask a question, isn't it? Uh, I am very proud of the effect that our policies have had on local government since we came into government. We came into government and we immediately removed £2.7 billion of ring fencing and allowing local government to answer to its own priorities, address its own priorities, answer to its own electorate. We have consistently uh, protected uh, local government from the scale of the cuts that have happened in England, where if you really want to see what an embarrassing record on local government is, I would suggest looking at Mr. England, Finley. where figures range between 27% in cuts, or one I saw last night as an analysis from the IFS and run-up to the 2015 election was a 36% cut in central government funding to local government in England. We are far away from that, and I'm very proud that we are. Thanks very much. Question six, Margaret Mitchell. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussion is had with local authorities in relation to the commissioning of third sector services. Minister Mark Biaggi. Scottish ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of all local authorities to discuss a wide range of matters of current interest to local organisations. Under the Local Authority's Single Outcome Agreement, delivery decisions on commissioning services are made locally, reflecting knowledge and understanding of local need. Okay, Margaret Thank Mitchell. the Minister for that answer. Can he outline the process for the allocation of the additional £1.85 million of criminal justice funding, which was invested in providing additional support for victims of sex crimes across Scotland, including male and female survivors of childhood sexual abuse? And can he give an indication when the many small charities doing specialist work in this area and who are awaiting a decision about their core funding applications submitted in September 2015 can expect a decision. The uh, member raises some very important issues and I will uh, endeavour to have the, my justice colleagues uh, investigate and respond in uh, as short an order as possible. Thank you so much. Question 7, Graham Day. 
uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many people have received support into home ownership since 2007. Minister Margaret Burgess. Since 2007, the Scottish Government has spent over £800 million supporting over 20,000 households into home ownership through a range of initiatives which include the low-cost initiative for first-time buyer schemes and the Help to Buy Scotland scheme. From sales forms returned by buyers, between 70 and 75 per cent of all sales across the different low-cost home ownership and Help to Buy schemes were aged between 18 and 34. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that response. Could I ask her to outline how the Government intends to build on that success in supporting people into home ownership and whether such measures will be targeted at those who need support to get on or move up the housing ladder? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, certainly, uh, explain to the Minister we are committed to the member. We are doing everything we can to help first time buyers and existing homeowners to buy a home where it is sensible and sustainable for them. For 2015-16, we have allocated £160 million to help up to 5,000 people to buy a home. £80 million of this has been allocated to our popular open market shared equity scheme to help up to 2,000 first-time buyers buy their first home, and £80 million has been allocated to our Help to Buy Scotland scheme. And it's an affordable build scheme to help um, first-time buyers and existing homeowners to get a new build home. The £80 million allocated to the Help to Buy Scotland Affordable New Build Scheme forms part of the £195 million allocated over the next three years to help up to 7,500 home homeowners to build a new home, buy a new home. Thanks, Gavin Brown. Thank you. The Minister just said it would be £160 million for 1516. What will it be for 1617? Minister. Um, what we're looking at is, uh, sorry, I'm just ch checking what, what we've announced, but certainly the budget announced we clearly um, invest a, a, a further £80 million through the Open Market Shared Equity Scheme in 2016-17. That remains the same as we've, we've spent in 2015-16, and the £80 million has already been announced of the £195 million, um, which has been allocated to help to buy over the next three years. So that announcement was made by the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I believe last month. Right. Many thanks. Question eight, Dr. Lane Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many homes for social rent and how many for mid market rent will have been built in Dumfries and Galloway between May 2011 and March 2016. Minister. Okay, between the 1st of May 2011 and 30th of September 2015, £23 million funding supported the, con the construction of 642 homes for social and mid-market rent in Dumfries and Galloway, which includes 595 social rented homes and 47 intermediate rented homes. Our projected investment for this year is a further £8.255 million to support the building of more affordable homes in the region. An update to housing statistics for Scotland will be published in March 2016 on the Scottish Government website. This will include the number of completions for the period October to December 2015. Housing statistics to the end of March 2016 will be published in June 2016. Thank you very much, Elaine Murray. I uh, thank the Minister for her full uh, response. Uh, Minister, I was co contacted recently by a couple with four children in a two-bedroom property with a box room, 40 overcrowding points, and one of 24 families who are applying for eight four-bedroomed properties in the Annan area, none of which have become available in the last 12 months. Now, Consideration was being given to other methods of funding for housing associations to build additional properties for social rent, such as the use of pension funds. And I wonder if the Minister can give any update of uh, whether or not progress has been made in looking for additional sources of funding. Minister. I would say to a couple of things to the Member that we have um, clearly set a target of 50,000 new affordable homes uh, for the next five years of the Parliament back with £3 billion of investment. But we are working with the sector, housing associations, local authorities and right across the sector to look at other ways of supporting and funding uh, affordable rented houses. So yes, uh, that is ongoing. We have the scheme up and running uh, in Falkirk through Falkirk Pension Fund and that can set an example to other uh, pension funds. But it's clearly up to the trustees of funds where they wish to, to make their investments. But yes, we're certainly still looking at that. Thanks. Briefly, Joan McAlpine. 
Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assurances it can provide on the future of attendance allowance in Scotland in light of concerns in England regarding its proposed transfer to local authorities. Government Secretary, briefly. Presiding Officer, the UK Government has not yet published its consultation on transferring attendance allowance to local authorities down south, so I am not in a position to comment in any detail on the proposal. However, my understanding is that this proposal will not impact on the devolution of attendance allowance to the Scottish Parliament so that is currently being implemented or will be implemented through the Scotland Bill. We are currently considering how we will use the new devolved social security powers and will be publishing our plans in the coming months. In the meantime, we will continue to engage with users and stakeholders as we develop the detail of our policies. I can assure you at this point the current attendance allowance recipients will be protected however we choose to use the devolved powers. Thank you. Briefly, Joan McAlpine. Yes, I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, there is a lot of concern in England about devolving attendance allowance because of the Independent Living Fund. Uh, when it was devolved to English local authorities, of course, it was cut, where, whereas when it was devolved Question. to the Scottish Government, it was continued. And can he assure us that something similar will happen to attendance allowance? Absolutely. The presiding officer, the Independent Living Fund is a very good example of how we protect services in Scotland compared to the axing of services south of the border. Uh, the, Independent Living exam uh, the Independent Living Fund uh, is a new scheme now in Scotland and it went live in July 2015, safeguarding the rights of 2,800 existing ILF users in Scotland and with an extra £5 million committed to open up the scheme to new users. The successful creation of the Scottish Welfare Fund after the abolition of elements of UK Government Social Fund is another example of where we have protected provision of a vital service and increased the funding over and above that devolved by the UK Government. The latest statistics for the Welfare Fund um, shows that it has paid out £81 million and helped 178,000 households since April 2013. Thanks very much. And that concludes that portfolio of questions. Now move to Fair Work, Skills and Training. Question 1, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many local authorities have outstanding equal pay claims. Mr Annabel Yu. Uh, local authorities as employers are responsible for dealing with equal pay claims by their staff, so information on the number of claims, claims is not held centrally. The Minister for Local Government and Community Empowerment, Marco Biaggi, has written to all Scottish local authorities asking for information about equal pay claims. The letter he sent reiterated the need for cases to be resolved with urgency and with commitment so that those affected receive their legal entitlements and local authorities meet their legal obligations. Thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. I uh, thank the Minister for that reply. And the Minister will be aware that the issue of equal pay claims, equal pay claims has been a long-standing issue and it was raised in the Chamber last November. And the First Minister encouraged local authorities to conclude these settlements as quickly as possible. And thankfully, since then, Fife Council has actually done that, but many still remain. But uh, the Minister just highlighted in terms of the, the, the local government minister writing to local authorities. But can I ask uh, the, the Minister uh, to consider once again, before this Parliament uh, dissolves for the election, to once again write the two local authorities just to impress upon them the importance so that we can actually allow people who are affected to move on with their lives. Minister. Um, I, I share the, the member's uh, frustration and indeed probably those of, of his uh, constituents who may be affected uh, with the uh, delays that are ongoing in the settlement of these claims. Uh, however, I would reiterate, presiding officer, that the settlement of claims is the responsibility of local authorities. Uh, notwithstanding that, as I referred to, Mr Biaggi did write to all local authorities on the 28th of October last year. Uh, he received uh, only 11 replies and wrote again to the others on 11 December last year. Uh, further, I think, to that second letter, it has be, uh, been agreed that there will, in fact, be a meeting uh, with the Minister and with COSLA representatives and representatives from the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, and that will take place on the 12th of February this year. So I would encourage all local authorities who uh, have still got outstanding claims to do the right thing and to ensure that these claims are settled as quickly as possible. Many thanks. Question two, Claudia Beamish. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has on women employed in part-time and temporary work. Minister. Uh, the Labour Force survey produced by the Office for National Statistics is the source of information on women employed in part-time and uh, in temporary work. And the latest available data 
in terms of the labour market statistics for the period September to November 2015 show that female part-time working decreased by 38,000 over the year and female temporary working by 7,000, whilst at the same time female full-time working increased by 27,000 over the year. Many thanks. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer. While that's encouraging, uh, I've, I've had information from Spice reported in Scotland 2015 that 41% of women work part-time compared to 11% of men. And as women are more likely to work part-time and make up the majority of, of those in the workforce who are part-time, Close the Gap suggests it is the relevant to compare is... women's and men's earnings on this basis. For every pound, that a, for every pound a man earns, a woman earns 83.2 pence. And I wonder, what is the Scottish Government actively doing to rectify this very bad situation? Minister. Uh, well, uh, I think the, the member's uh, supplementary point concerns principally the, the issue of the gender pay gap, if, if I've uh, understood correctly. And, of course, the gender pay gap uh, uh, is unacceptable. It's unacceptable in 2015 that we are still talking about it. Uh, I would point out to the member uh, that the gender pay gap uh, in Scotland has decreased from 9.1% in 2014 to 7.3% in 2015. But, of course, uh, it is still unacceptable that there is any gender pay gap. This legislation was introduced in Westminster in 1970, the Equal Pay Act, and notwithstanding the success of Westminster governments of both hues, we still are faced with the situation. We in the Scottish Government will do everything that we can uh, to ensure that this pay gap is narrowed to the point that it no longer exists. And we are pursuing a number of important uh, initiatives in terms of expansion of childcare, in terms of the promotion of flexible working, in terms of challenging pay and pregnancy maternity discrimination, in terms of challenging occupational segregation, in terms of promoting 50-50 gender balance on boards, and of course in terms of promoting uh, the living wage for social care workers. I do hope that the local authorities across Scotland will respond to this very good funding deal on offer and do the right thing by social care workers, the majority of whom, of course, are women. Many thanks. Question three, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government about the Trade Union Bill. Uh, in addition to a telephone call with Nick Bowles, Minister of State for Schools, on 8 October uh, 2015, I have now written to him on five separate occasions, setting out the Scottish Government's increasing concern with the Bill proposals and seeking Scotland's exemption from the extent of the Bill, uh, although he has not yet responded to any of those letters. The First Minister raised this issue in her meeting with the Prime Minister on the 14th December and of course the Scottish Parliament debate held on 26 January demonstrated the opposition uh, of Parliament uh, to the Bill. I do want to reassure each and every worker in Scotland that we are doing what we can uh, to deal with the potentially uh, damaging legislation being applied in Scotland and I can say that just before I came to the Chamber uh, I received confirmation of a meeting with Nick Bowles, uh, specifically to discuss the Trade Union Bill. It will take place tomorrow morning. Mr Chisholm. Uh, Secretary, for the answer, I support any and all means to defeat this uh, appalling legislation, in including its intrusion on areas of devolved uh, competence. But if all else fails, will the Scottish Government uh, join uh, councils in Scotland in refusing to comply with this legislation? Cabinet Secretary. All I can do is to quote the words of the First Minister that uh, we will go on doing uh, what we are doing at the moment. Uh, uh, there are aspects of the bill which it will be impossible to uh, avoid. There are aspects of the bill uh, which we are currently discussing directly with the STUC, amongst others, including COSLA, in order to establish how best we can uh, uh, deal with the likely consequences if the worst comes to the worst, if this bill is passed, although we are not giving up uh, seeking exemptions uh, in respect of its, uh, uh, of its various uh, aspects. Thank you. Question four, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what innovative steps are being taken to help improve skills and provide training for adults in Scotland. Minister Annabel Ewing. Um, uh, achievement of our ambitions for a more productive and inclusive uh, Scotland uh, involve uh, a greater focus on strengthening and developing the skills of all of our people. The Scottish Government is committed to developing these skills, whether in colleges, universities, communities or workplaces, and ensuring that our people are able to thrive in sustainable employment. In particular, Skills Development Scotland delivers an all-age career service, uh, and we also have, of course, um, uh, our modern apprenticeship programme applying also to those aged over uh, 25 in key and uh, enabling sectors. Thank you. Liz Smith. Uh, 
the Minister be aware that the principal at Dundee and Angus College, Grant Ritchie, has suggested that one potential way of addressing the key education needs of long-term unemployed uh, would be for more opportunities to be provided to develop literacy and IT. Uh, he's made the suggestion that uh, colleges could help address this by opening in the evening to provide additional classes. Could I ask the Scottish Government if they would undertake to discuss with Colleges Scotland this important initiative? Minister. Um, I, I thank the member for her interesting uh, point. Um, I, I suspect that that is something that I probably should discuss first with the Cabinet Secretary for Education because I think it does seem to fall within her immediate remit. But I promise to do that. Uh, and I know that Dundee and Angus College have been pursuing uh, an interesting programme with their Code Academy. Uh, and uh, I was interested to, to learn about that. And I will be, in fact, visiting Dundee and Angus, Angus College in a couple of weeks, albeit in another matter. But I will take the opportunity when I am there to hear more about the proposals that the member was referring to. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. The 2015 Employer Skills Survey showed that 71% of Scottish employers offer training to their staff. This was a higher rate than England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Can the, the Minister provide an update on what else can be done to continue that good progress? Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. It is the case that the recent statistics show that uh, uh, employers in Scotland are doing uh, more and more to ensure that young people are given an opportunity. We will continue uh, to uh, work as hard as we can to uh, bring more employers on board. We have set a uh, very ambitious uh, uh, modern apprenticeship target of 30,000 starts by 2020 and we are working uh, closely with employers, with training providers uh, and third sector and others to ensure that young people get the training that they need and that employers also uh, have uh, the possibility of uh, creating a more dynamic workplace with young people uh, there on site and of course ensuring proper succession planning for the employers themselves. Thanks, Richard Simpson. On the modern apprenticeships, can I ask the Minister what progress that has been made in ensuring that people with disabilities enter the apprenticeship scheme? The last time we looked at this, the figures in England were around 7 per cent. The figures in Scotland were less than 1 per cent of disabled people entering the apprenticeship scheme, and the Government gave an undertaking to do something about it. What's happened since? Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do remember that exchange uh, uh, in the chamber with Dr Simpson and uh, since that time uh, a number of uh, issues have come to light, one being the issue of uh, self-certification as to whether or not you certify as having a disability or not. But in any event, leaving that issue to one side, which we have already aired uh, together in this chamber, uh, the member may be aware that we published uh, through Skills Development Scotland the Equality Action Plan that I had referred to in those previous debates. It was published, I think, on the 2nd of December uh, last year, presiding officer, and we will be working uh, closely uh, with SCS to ensure that we move forward and meet the various uh, objectives and targets set forth in that Equality Action Plan on this very, very important issue. Many thanks. Rob Gibson, question five. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what aspects of fair work it has discussed recently with Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Capsec. The Scottish Government promotes the benefits of fair work in the Highlands and Islands as we do across Scotland. We have regular discussions with uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise on a range of issues. Uh, for example, High actively contributed to the development and implementation of the Scottish Business Pledge, discussions around future employment services and investors in people. In October 2015, HIE contributed to discussions with the Fair Work Convention in Inverness. Account managers from HIE regularly discuss fair work innovation and internationalisation with individual businesses as part of their efforts to boost productivity and inclusive growth. Thanks, Rob Gibson. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. I don't know whether the Cabinet Secretary has sought uh, HIE's views on the impact on details of a change to the Scottish Government's version of the living wage uh, for hospitality workers, uh, just as the Scalloway Hotel in Shetland has announced. A, a specific discussion with HIE about the Scalloway Hotel announcement, but of course we do uh, strongly welcome that. I'm pleased to say that the number of living wage accredited organisations is growing rapidly and has now reached 460 of our target uh, of 500. Uh, I could say that 37 are within uh, HIE area. Uh, the accreditation of the Scalloway Hotel, an excellent hotel, emphasises that employers from across all of Scotland and in all sectors are recognising the benefits of fair pay. And there are now a variety of accredited employers in tourism and hospitality making significant efforts to reward staff within two sectors that are traditionally low paid. Put succinctly, 
the, uh, the, the measure that the Scalloway Hotel ha has taken, that particular move, shows that it can be done. Excellent. Question six, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed the devolution of employment support services with the UK Government. The Scottish Government is in frequent discussions with the UK Government regarding contracted employment support services uh, that were intended to be devolved from April 2017. My next meeting with the UK Minister for Employment, Priti Patel, is scheduled on the 11th of February. My officials continue to work with those in UK Government to build strong relations focused on the future needs of unemployed Scots. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank Cabinet Secretary for that uh, answer and ask the Cabinet Secretary if she agrees with me that cutting the budget by 87% after deciding to devolve these powers not only breaks one of the things that not only breaks the so-called vow, but it's also against the very spirit of the Smith Agreement. Cabinet we do believe that the drastic reduction in programme spend suggested by the UK Government does undermine the spirit and intention of the Smith Commission. Uh, but more to the point, it fundamentally reduces the ability of the Scottish Government to provide employment support for those with significant barriers to enter employment. We are still awaiting progress through the fiscal framework on details of a final settlement to be offered by the UK Government. Clearly, however, we do believe that what is proposed in respect of uh, this particular aspect of it will create severe financial restrictions for us to operate within following devolution of the services. Thanks. Question 7, Margaret McDougall. To ask the Scottish Government what skills and other training it provides to people in Ayrshire who have been made redundant. Redundancy Absolutely. triggers support through our initiative for responding to redundancy situations, Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, more commonly known as PACE, SDS leads on the delivery of PACE support on behalf of the Scottish Government in conjunction with a number of key partners, including the DWP. Through providing skills development and employability support, PACE aims to minimise the time individuals affected by redundancy out, are out of work. And it is tailored to meet individual needs and local circumstances. In Ayrshire, from April 2015 until December 2015, PACE support was provided to 552 individuals from 13 companies. Thank you. Margaret McDougall. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware that over recent months there have been announcements of job losses rolling into the hundreds across Ayrshire, around 60 at Clydeport, 77 at Red Cross House, 212 including agency workers at Mal Kamarnock, and just last week we heard that Britanno and the next store are closing in Irvine. In addition, Hauco and Irvine will shed Briefly. 50 jobs. This is after public money was invested in the plant, although neither the Scottish Government nor Scottish Enterprise appear willing to disclose Labour Councillor Joe Cullinane's how, to how much public money was invested for a return of 50 P45s. What does the Scottish Government going, do in this respect? Because there is a steady leakage of jobs in Ayrshire. So what exactly are they going to do to protect the local Ayrshire economy? Well, we work very hard uh, through a number of different ways uh, uh, to protect uh, the, the whole of the Scottish economy as well as in the, the local labour markets. And there will be uh, work done uh, by SDS through the apprenticeship scheme, through uh, local employers, through the development of DYW, the local DYW group, uh, through the local authorities as well, who I know are actively uh, uh, encouraging uh, employment opportunities through their local employment hubs. I think uh, a great deal is being done. Uh, the issue of what happens when people become redundant, however, is that we do put in as much support as we can in order to ensure that people's period of redundancy lasts as little time as possible. Kenneth Gibson. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree that uh, the Ayrshire growth deal will do a lot to help create um, jobs in North Ayrshire and put a lot of these redundant workers back to work and that it shows the tremendous level of cooperation between the three Ayrshire councils and the Scottish Government and private business uh, that this is actually ongoing and should deliver substantially for Ayrshire in the years ahead? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know that there is a great deal of cooperation between the three councils and I think that's to be commended there uh, delivering and developing uh, a very good uh, um, uh, employability offer on a local basis. I'm 
delighted the, the increased number of opportunities that have been provided in uh, North Ayrshire. I'm encouraged by the partnership by local authorities, Skills Development Scotland, uh, local employers and wider partners in supporting our ambitions for the further expansion of the programme and the opportunities that this will provide for young people and employers in the area. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. We are now moving to the next item of business, which is